we would now like to take a close look at the very deep south of India in our overall discussion of five centuries, circa 200 BC to about 300 AD. The situation around the 500 years we are now going to talk about is something quite peculiar in the deep south of India. The images that we get for these 500 years do not exactly match or correspond to the patterns of development in socio-economic life, in political life, in cultural life that we are generally accustomed to see in the context of North India, in the context of the Deccan. All these features combine to produce the image of a distinct phase which is called early historical. The two essential features, the formation of state society and urban society, yes, these are generally present all over the subcontinent, but the scenario in the deep south neither match in chronology nor does it match in terms of the pattern of development that we encounter in North India or in the Deccan Plateau area. In fact, the arrival of well-established territorial monarchical polity comes rather slowly in the deep south. Now, how do we know about this? This is largely known, the scenario of the deep south is largely known through a particular type of literary text popularly known as Sangam or Chankam literature. Now, the Sangam or Chankam literature is the earliest known literary compositions creations in Tamil language. This is essentially a bardic poetry, collection of poems composed by bards, minstrels. It is only at a much later date that the oral poetry were later given the shape of a textual production. That is, they were much later reduced to writing and the entire collection is called Sangam or Chankam. Apart from being the earliest known compositions in Tamil language and we have to keep it in mind that Tamil is one of the recognized classical languages of India and this is the earliest known examples of Tamil literary form. That is why it has a very major historical uh, significance and it demands an in-depth inquiry into that area through largely literature. Now, if we go a slightly backward, one of the earliest stated notices of the deep south came in the form of Ashoka's inscriptions in 3rd century BC. The great Maurya ruler categorically mentioned in his inscriptions that the Cholas, the Pandyas, the Keralaputras, the Satyaputras and Sri Lanka, Tamraparni were people or areas beyond his realm. Now, this Cholas, Satya, Pandyas, Satyaputra, Keralaputra, these are located in deep south, present day Tamil Nadu area and Kerala, though some parts of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh 
may also form the cultural zone of the Sangam literature and that's why we prefer the term Tamilakam and this is this term also occurs in the Sangam literature. It is quite clear that Tamil was the earliest literary language among the entire Dravidian language groups and this is now, now known also from the study of Tamil Brahmi inscriptions. The discovery and decipherment and the detailed study of many inscriptions written in Brahmi script but in the earliest available form of Tamil language is known to us in the scholarly world as Tamil Brahmi inscriptions. Perhaps the greatest authority on this Tamil Brahmi inscriptions is Iravatam Mahadevan. His detailed study clearly shows that it is from the middle of the second century BC that the earliest known Tamil Brahmi inscriptions came into our visibility. Therefore, this is one of the sure benchmarks of dating the one of the earliest phases of Tamil language and literature. We can begin from the second century BC. We have already said that by third century BC, Ashoka's inscriptions spoke about four groups of people, four regions, Cholas, Pandyas, Satyaputra, Keralaputra by about 3rd century BC. It appears that the presence of the Mauryas up to Karnataka area in 3rd century BC probably left an impact and led to the creation of the Tamil Brahmi script for writing inscriptions. Therefore, this impact is of significance. However, it has nothing to do with the composition of the Sangam literature. Now, before we go into the details of understanding the Sangam texts as a literary creation, we would also like to point out that the Sangam literary texts should also be studied in conjunction not only with the near contemporary Tamil Brahmi inscriptions, but also along with the availability of a few coins issued by these Cholas, Pandyas, the Chera chiefs in Kerala, etc. There are also considerable advances, advancements in field archaeological researches. Many of the places mentioned in Sangam literature have now been identified on the basis of field archaeological materials which have been found out from explored and excavated archaeological sites. The other interesting point here is that the period which is generally associated with the Sangam literature the five centuries from circa 200 BC to about 300 AD also figures in two other kinds of sources. This is the classical accounts written in Greek and Latin languages. Greek texts like the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea, Periplus Tes Erythras Thalassus and Ptolemy's geography, Geographicae Hufagesis, and then the famous Latin text of Pliny, the natural history, about 80 AD, 79 AD. All these are more or less contemporaneous to the period that is covered by the Sangam literature. So, when we look at Sangam literature, our thrust definitely is on this earliest Tamil poet poetry, but we shall also pay adequate attention to the supplementary information 
available from field archaeological materials, inscriptions, coins and information available in Greek and Latin texts. It is like it may be possible that what is known from Sangam literature may not exactly match the information available from other sources. So, there could be both a correspondence and also a contrast. We can now gradually move into the nitty gritties of the Sangam texts as a literary product of Tamilakam. Tamilakam would indicate what is presently the state of Tamil Nadu, the state of Kerala, the areas of Mysore in Karnataka and also the Kurg area in Karnataka and the Chittur area in Andhra Pradesh. There were Kerala Putras who would be known in the Sangam literature as the Cheras. Even the Greek and Latin texts knew them as Keprobotras or Cheraputras. Similarly, the term Satyaputra which is identifiable also with the Satyaman type of groups in northern part of Tamil Nadu. Now, these names or the name endings Satyaputra, Kerala Putra, this suffix Putra literally meaning sons indicate a system of clan which is determined by succession from one clan, one family and therefore it is essentially a kinship organization rather than the scenario of a well-defined territorial polity usually under the head of a monarchical state that is king. But there is a major problem whether these king-like figures were really heads of monarchical states or they were essentially chieftains. In fact, here lies the peculiarity or the individuality of the political experience of Tamilakam and that is why it has its individuality, its difference from the experience that one usually encounters in the context of North India and also the Deccan. But before we delve into the situation of politics, let us first look at what is the Sangam text? What is the name of meaning of the name Sangam? The name Sangam or Chankam is generally associated with the notion of an assembly, Sangam, assembly of scholars. In fact, there, are, there is a tradition that there were in later times at least three such assemblies of scholars where this bardic oral poetry called Sangam literature, poems, were anthologized, were put into a collection, which were loose, floating, bardic poetry were given the form of a text and in the form of the text they were later reduced. Along with this Sangam text, one also has one of the earliest texts in Tamil on Tamil grammar, Tolkapyam. But Tolkapyam is slightly later text about 5th century AD. That is why the period of Sangam literature is generally taken from say 200 BC to 300 AD, maximum 400 AD. One thing is very clear, the language, the literature, the social, economic and cultural scenario, the political setup seen in this particular genre of literature, which is called the Sangam text, is quite different from two other celebrated Tamil literary texts, the two Tamil epics, Shilapadikaram and Manimekhalai. Now, Silappadikaram and Manimekhalai are possibly dated to a later period around 6th, 7th, 8th, maximum 8th century, practically 6th and 7th centuries. Around 8th century, there was the first attempt 
to collate and codify this floating mass of bardic poetry. And then it is only between 12th and 14th century, possibly under the Pandyan rulers of Madurai, that commentaries on this text, the bardic poetry were composed. Now, these later collections, these later codifications, later commentaries gives the name Sangam or Chankam. That is why it has become popular as Sangam or Chankam. In the early texts, the earliest literary layer does not use the term Sangam or Chankam. It mainly speaks of the two types of a collection of poems. One is called Ettuttokai, the other is Pattupattu. Now, Ettuttokai consists of eight collections of poems. The Ettuttokai, that is the collection of eight, has these eight texts. And then in the Pattu Pattu, which has 10 songs or 10 idyls. Once again, if we look at it to Tokai, the last two, these are definitely post sankam post chankam creations. That means even in these two basic collection of poetry, there are different literary layers. It is the enormous and painstaking scholarly contributions from scholar like K. Kailasapati, George Hart, Zvelevil, A. K. Ramanujam, M. G. S. Narayanan, R. Champakalakshmi, Rajan Gurukkal. Now we know by through the immense contribution of these scholars that even the term Sangam poetry has many literary layers belonging to different chronological phases, and therefore it speaks of changes and continuity in society, economy, polity and culture between the period 200 BC to 300 AD, it is not a static scenario even for this 500 years. It is also very clear that what we mean by the Sangam texts, it is not a homogeneous corpus either in style or in form and definitely not homogeneous in terms of chronology. There are obviously later additions to this main text. It has also been observed that the text do not, I quote, betray the slightest evidence of any conscious literary endeavor. These were quite spontaneous, composed by birds in praise of heroes, heroes essentially as rulers, as chiefs, as powerful chiefs of warring groups, of powerful polities like the Cholas, the Pandyas, the Keralas, the Cheras. Now, in spite of the various layers and also the uh, lack of homogeneity in terms of style, form or chronological spread. There is one point of commonality in the Sangam poetry. We have already mentioned it really moves on two dominant genres. One is Akham, which literally talks of the interior or love poems and Puram, which is essentially meant for public or 
war poems. Now, what is the theme of aham or love? The love is expressed in separation and union, before or after marriage, in chastity or betrayal. There are seven types of love. Two are considered improper type of love and five proper type of loves, which are divided into two broad categories, premarital, premarital love and love within marriage and also love what may be called extramarital love. If this is the main thing of Akam, in Puram, the main theme is war. Like Akam or the theme of love, Puran, Puram also has seven situations and once again, two situations are not prescribed. So there is a particular pattern. The rest five themes within Puram actually deal with public celebration of the feats of heroes, even the death of the hero in war. And of course, since it is bardic composition, the bards talk about the magnanimity of their heroes. These two basic themes also emerge something very, very peculiar and special, typical of the Sangam literature. And this point needs to be very carefully and thoroughly uh, studied. This is called the Tinei concept. The Tinei actually deals with five types of poetic situations. That is, these five types of poetic situations figure in terms of locating the poetic themes. The poetic themes belong to two genres, Akam that is love and Puram that is war once again thanks to the analysis of Kailasapati can now be clearly understood as actual landscapes or eco zones and the five eco zones, five tinei can be identified and distinguished on the basis of natural flowers and plants. When we talk about the a total of the five eco zones, it is called Aintinai. Now, what are these? There are considerable diversities if one looks at the landscape of the hilly or mountainous zone to pastoral area to coastal area to fertile plains and once again to the dry areas. Now these areas are the zones of operations of the heroes which is essentially the theme of the praise of heroes, their love, their separation, their warlike activities all figure in the two types of Akham and Puram poems in the Sangam texts. Now here comes the question of polity and politics. It is quite clear from the study of these poems that there were more chieftains than heads of monarchical states, the kind of Maharaja Dhirajas we come, come across in North India or the very powerful Satavahana kings in the Deccan. In the deep south, we encounter more chieftains than the heads of monarchical states through the Sangam literature. The common feature is a hero who has wounds in the frontal part of the body and face, he is praised because these marks of injury are signs of heroism. But if the injury mark is on the back, then it is a sign of cowardice. 
in the poem. Now, how many ruling families do we come across in the Sangam text? There are actually three levels of political powers which are expressed in the terms Ventar or Vendar, Velir and Killer. It indicates some kind of hierarchical nature in the power structure in which we come across tribal oligarchic groups to monarchical state structure. The important point is here, it revolves around the hero Makkal. Now, who is a Ventar? The term Ventar usually is referred to in the number of three, Muvar. And who are the three? These are the three most distinguished of preeminent powers, the Cholas, the Cheras, the Pandyas. We have already mentioned these figure for the first time in written records in Ashoka's inscriptions way back in 3rd century BC. We did not know in the time of Ashoka what was the political organization of the Cholas, Cheras and Pandyas. Now we know from the Sangam literature slightly later than the days of Ashoka that these formed the preeminent political groups and that is why called as Vintar or Vindar the preeminent and always figuring as three. These are the three most preeminent groups. Of these, the Cholas were in the Kaveri Valley and Kaveri Delta, the Cheras in the western part of Tamil Nadu and the Pandyas in the area around Madurai, what is present day Vaigai Valley and Vaigai Delta. Many of these great heroes have been figuring in the Sangam text. Take for example, we can give a figure. There are as many as 138 poems in praise of 43 Ventars. That would give one a rough idea how regularly the the heroic achievements of the three preeminent ruling groups cover the attention of these poems. We shall discuss a little bit more on the political scenario in the following discussion. Mm -hmm.